Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Idaho Public Television Endowment. They didn't want to kill people. They sometimes didn't even want to beat people but they were gonna do what they had to do to get what they wanted to get. Coming up, it turns out that some early American politicians were pretty violent guys. I talked with a scholar who studied the phenomenon and learned what lessons it may hold for today's political climate. That's Dialogue Next, stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. My guest today loves what she does, as you will soon hear, and that's even when she's writing a book called Field of Blood. Yale professor of history Joanne Freeman is known for her expertise on Alexander Hamilton. She edited a comprehensive volume of his writings and is featured in the PBS documentary Hamilton's America. Now, Professor Freeman became interested in Hamilton in part because of her fascination with the art and philosophy of dueling. Hamilton, of course, died in a fatal duel with Aaron Burr. In her book, Affairs of Honor, Freeman examined the ways that early American politicians used dueling and other expressions of an honor code to gain and hold power. She's continued that scholarship in Field of Blood, which uncovers the extent to which the U.S. Congress before the Civil War was a much more violent place than previously thought. I talked with Professor Freeman about her findings and whether there are parallels to our current political situation. Our conversation was taped at the 2019 Sun Valley Writers Conference. We begin, though, by focusing on a very special companion Freeman had while writing her book. Well, welcome to Sun Valley, or I should say welcome back. You've been here before, but not for such an extended period of time, right? Right, I have not had the pleasure of being able to actually stay here, so yeah. And I was checking out your Twitter feed, and it sounds like you've been having a great time here. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> I always forget, you know, this is gonna be the goofiest thing in the world to say. I tweet something out because it's what I'm feeling at the moment, and then I forget that the entire world can see. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of followers. I, I want do. I would say 43, 44,000 or something like that. Something like that. I know you like birds, right? I adore birds, yeah. yeah. So have you, have you seen any cool ones while you've been here? I did, but I'm a person who adores birds and doesn't know what they are called. So I saw a large hopping bird, and I could not tell you for the life of me what it was, but it was very cool looking. So <laughs> I did see a bird that got my attention since well, I've been here. A bird accompanied you as you wrote this book we're gonna talk about, right? He did, he, he pretty much sat next to me for most of the writing of the book. Um, so both the bird and the book, uh, he died just when I finished uh, and it took me 17 years to write the book and I got him when I started it and he died when I ended it so he is my book bird. And the wonderful thing, he was a cockatiel and he talked had a pretty extensive vocabulary. So, and he very much wanted to do, I guess I was his flock, he wanted to do whatever I did. So I would be in absolute silence, like researching and writing and doing whatever I was doing, and then I would come up with some ridiculous example of congressional mayhem. And in the silence, I would just laugh. And he would go, ha, ha, ha. So he accompanied me in the writing of the book in, in more ways than one. Well, I think it's awesome as a pet person myself that you acknowledged, is it Boo? Is Boo. That you acknowledged. Oh my gosh, Boo's making TV coverage. Yes. I can't even tell you how happy this makes well, me. Well, it's very important yes. uh, to acknowledge the animals in our life, I think. More than one so. pet owner has now told me they are going to acknowledge their pet in their acknowledgments for their books since I, I apparently, I didn't know it was something you didn't do. <laughs> well, as you mentioned, 17 years the life of your bird, uh, <laughs> the age of your students, some of them. Absolutely. So this this is a topic that's interested you for a while. Your previous book was touched on it. Why do you think that is? What What is it that uh, draws you to that kind of subject? That's such a good question. Um, I think it's, I think it partly has to do with wanting to understand people. I mean, a lot of people don't think of history as being and this is gonna sound odd, human or real, right? And I think if, if a history teacher is bad, that means that typically they're making someone memorize facts and history then becomes absolutely not about human beings. I'm really interested in understanding 
people, and in particular, people from, who are far enough in the past that some of what they're doing seems really foreign or alien or strange. What I love to do is kind of immerse myself in that world and get a sense of the words that they use and understand what they think the, the shoulds and shouldn'ts of their time period are and figure that out. And violence is something that, on the one hand, in the moment, has a real logic to the people who are engaged in it, but sometimes looking on from a, either a historical distance or even just standing outside doesn't seem to make sense. Um, you know, initially dueling, the practice of dueling pulled me in partly because how does that make sense? Right? How does it make sense that two people, two men, go out on a field and shoot at each other and that supposedly will redeem someone's honor. It, it seemingly doesn't make sense, and yet it made a lot of sense to a lot of people who were very smart in early America, the, the 18th, 19th centuries. And to me, that kind of a, um, cultural puzzle, I just, I love figuring that out. Ultimately, you were able to uh, really verify about 70 or at least 70 kind of maelstroms of, <laughs> Some sort physical violence of various sorts. Yeah, 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 and we'll talk about how you did that. But um, explain to folks watching what you mean by that. What was going on? By violence, I mean um, fist fights, uh, Bowie knives being pulled, pistols being pulled, canings, um, shoving matches, um, huge melees where there are dozens of guys sort of slugging each other between the aisles. Physical violence. We're talking about physical violence, which is not generally speaking how people imagine not just American politics or high politics, but the 19th century with like, you know, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster and they're sort of, you know, all standing in black doing a variety of noble things. And I think that's what people mostly think about. And obviously there was a lot happening around the people standing there with their, <laughs> saying noble things with their finger in the air. These incidents though were kind of glossed over or even censored from, um, the newspapers or what passed for the congressional record of the time, there was all sorts of kind of roundabout ways that they talked about this obliquely. Yes. Um, and so that, that also made it hard to research, right? Well, that was one of the, there were, there were a lot of tricks to this project and one of them was absolutely the period's equivalent of the congressional record doesn't include most of these incidents. It, it, there are hints in the record which once you know the violence is there, you recognize the hints. So for example, the record will say something like, um, the debate became unpleasantly personal at one point. Now you wouldn't think that that means anything, but in at least one case, a congressman pulled a gun on another congressman. That is unpleasantly personal, but you wouldn't know what that meant. Well, and as I was reading your book, I was thinking, uh, thank goodness some of these politicians wrote to their wives. Yes. Because that was another source for you, because they would write home and say, oh my gosh, what's happening. Absolutely. Uh, they would write to their wives and say things kind of not surprisingly in letters to their wives that they wouldn't say otherwise. Um, they would talk about being afraid. Uh, there's one letter to a wife in which the person is trying to count how many guns he sees. Um, men admit all sorts of things to their wives that they wouldn't otherwise say. And if you're writing a book about people who are willing to fight for something, um, getting, plugging into people's emotions, and particularly male emotions, matters a lot. Uh, there's a diary of this man named Benjamin Brown French. So this man, so interesting, um, was a clerk, but also kind of a fly on the wall, or as you say in the book, for people who know Woody Allen, kind of a zealot. <laughs> he seemed to be always in the right place at the right times, amazing. Uh, events that he was present at. But he took notes, he took voluminous notes as a clerks, clerks often do, and um, this, these works were donated, right? And right. so you were able to look in this diary and also triangulate and try and figure out these episodes of violence. Right, and, and so yeah, there's this an amazing 11 volume diary that he left behind that his descendants gave to the Library of Congress. Um, and he, many diaries, when you look at diaries, are not much more than um, had lunch with Mr. Smith, uh, heard this today in Congress, whatever. They're not exactly spicy narratives. But French, and uh, as you suggest, partly because his job is putting things down on paper, and also he had a newspaper column, um, he wrote poetry, he was just someone who liked to write. He, his diary is an amazing, amazing artifact that tells you about what he's seeing and what he's feeling. 
and this is all in his diary. He comes to Washington from this little small New Hampshire town in 1833. Um, and he's liked by everyone. He's this sort of jovial guy. You know, people of all the parties like him. Northerners and Southerners like him. And he's what would it, at the time would have been called a doe-faced Democrat, meaning he would do anything to appease the South on the issue of slavery for his party, for the Union, for whatever. So he's that guy at the beginning of the book. And by the end of the book, he goes out to buy a gun in case he needs to shoot Southerners. And my thought was, if I can get the readers to travel that path with him. So he's not the narrator, but you definitely, he's alongside you throughout the book. That really shows you something, right? That's a different way at getting at some of the lead up to the Civil War. So why should people care that there was mayhem and, and violence? I mean, some people might say, well, yeah, leading up to the Civil War, not unexpected that tensions would be high and people would be you know, bellicose. Um, what does this say? What it shows you, among other things, is that this is how Congress functioned, and in particular, Southerners were using violence to intimidate and silence Northerners, often on the issue of slavery. It shows you that regime keeping itself in power in a way that we haven't recognized before, using violence and the ways in which Americans learned to turn on each other to the point that they were willing to shoot each other. If you pull the Civil War out of it, would we have seen as much violence in Congress? The short answer is part of the reason why we saw, and by saw, I mean, have been, people at the time saw so much violence, is technological. And that is because of the telegraph. And the telegraph, spread information around the nation in all kinds of ways it hadn't been before at a speed that had not been seen before. So things that could have been you know, silenced or kept behind the scenes could not be so much after a time. So certainly the nation became more aware of that violence, and in particular the North became more aware of the degree to which their representatives were being silenced or intimidated. And so it's you know, I can't say that without the Civil War there would not have been violence, but the violence is a long tradition of the South using it above and beyond the war. And then as the issues that lead to the war really begin to heat up, the violence gets worse with that. So it's, it's kind of a combination of both of those things. What was new for me reading it as well was that the Northerners at one point just said enough. You know, they allowed themselves to be bullied for a while because it wasn't necessarily in their culture as much to uh, engage in this, but at a certain point their constituents were saying stand up, they decided, you know, we need to stand up, um, and there's this letter from three of them saying, you know, who are abolitionists, saying, okay, this is a letter for posterity, we don't know what's going to happen to us, but we can't take it anymore and we're going to stand up. That letter made me cry. <laughs> um, it's an amazing letter. And it's, so things get much worse in Congress the last few years before the Civil War because of the issues leading to the war, but also because that's the birth of a northern anti-slavery political party. And that had never been there before. There had never been a group of people sent there to oppose slavery. And a lot of the people who were in that party, or at least a good number of them, were people who were willing to fight, and if necessary, physically fight. Their representatives told them, go fight for our rights. I mean, some of these men came to Washington with weapons. So they were prepared to be that person. And so very early in the project, I found this document, not intended for public eyes at the time, written by three abolitionist senators, written years after the fact. Um, and it explains what it felt like to be in Congress in the 1850s. They describe in this in intense emotional detail, how they were being humiliated and attacked and insulted every day by the Southerners. And so they decide that they will now willingly fight duels with these Southerners rather than be bullied by Southerners who say, well, you don't dare to do this. You, you wouldn't fight a duel, and thus I'm going to keep bullying you. And they say in this remarkable statement, we understood in making this decision our constituents would ostracize us. We might lose our jobs. Right? Dueling in the North at this point is seen as a barbaric Southern custom. They say in the statement, we understand all of that, but we can't stand by and allow this to happen. So we decided we would duel anyone who comes against us, and their phrase, to the coffin. So they're serious about it. And then they say, as you suggested in introducing it, at the very end, they say we're putting this down on paper so that posterity will understand what it felt like to oppose slavery on the floor of Congress before the Civil War. 
I found that incredibly moving on the one hand, and also they were speaking to me. Right? They were speaking to historians and people like me who were going to dig up this document. And I did precisely what they wanted me to do. It, was, it got me in my gut. It was like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a way of understanding the politics of that moment that, that I hadn't understood before. It's really, really interesting. Um, there were, this was what passed for entertainment in the day. You know, debates were printed in newspapers. There were people up in the galleries watching this. Sometimes women, yes, and um, you know, egging people on sometimes. So well, this was, you know, the culture itself was violent. Violent, absolutely, and that's a really important point. Is that um, the the book isn't intended to say, you know, Congress was a bad place and it was violent, and the rest of America was shocked, shocked. Uh, the United States was extremely violent in this time period rioting, dueling, slavery, Native Americans being slaughtered. There were all kinds of ways, election riots. There was a lot of violence in this period. And in that sense, Congress truly was being representative. The interesting part about Congress, and this is one of the things that got me interested in the beginning, it's like, what happens when Southern violence meets the Northern version of it and the Western version of it? And what happens, as the book shows, when the Southerners have an advantage, a cultural advantage of violence, that they can deploy to their benefit. That's part of what the book shows, that, that they were using violence and intimidation and bullying as a deliberate political tool. And for a while, it worked. They didn't want to break Congress. They just wanted what they wanted from Congress. So they didn't want to kill people. They sometimes didn't even want to beat people. But they were going to do what they had to do to get what they wanted to get. And sometimes that pushed them to that level. Well, let's pull this forward, um, because as a historian and a public historian, I'm sure you get asked, how does this relate to our times today? Is it a cautionary tale? Is it reflective of some things that are going on now? Is it both? Uh, you know, so 17 years ago, we were not in the place we are now. So the quirky thing about writing this book is that as the years went on, it became more and more timely in a way that as a historian, I never intended and certainly couldn't foresee, right? So coming out now, one, one or two people have said to me like, wow, that's incredibly savvy of you. It's like, no, there's nothing savvy about this at all. I started a bazillion years ago. Um, certainly, there are aspects of it that are, um, I don't want to say it's a cautionary tale, um, but that shows you the steps, the, the logic of, as I sort of suggested before, how Americans learn to other each other, right? So the, what the book is showing is a moment of intense polarization on a political issue with a huge moral component, right, slavery, uh, an issue that splinters political parties that no longer are operating like they used to, an issue that fills the press and, and press on all sides of the issue begin to create conspiracy theories about what the other side is doing, um, an issue that people begin to lose trust in national institutions of government because they seem unable to cope with the issue, an issue in which Amer some Americans are calling other Americans un-American. Obviously, I could stand up and give a lecture and tick off all of those things without telling you what time period it's in, and there are echoes in the, the kind of moment that we're in now. We're in an extreme moment of polarization. The 1850s was one, the 1960s was one, the 1790s was one. So there have been moments in American history where I think there's like a, Americans realize that there's some, I think somewhere I called it like a pathway issue, a major issue that people understand is fundamental about what America is that's under debate and that polarizes people. You know, in the 1790s, it was the workings of democracy, how democratic a republic should America be. Um, in the 1850s, obviously, it's slavery. In the 1960s, it's civil rights. And now I think it's citizenship. And these are all absolute key issues about what being American means. And you know, the telegraph as a new form of technology complicated politics. Social media as a new form of technology is doing very much the same thing, where it's connecting politicians and the public in ways that they were never connected before. It's spreading news without a spin. There's no filter. Um, things happen very quickly. Uh, and on the one hand, you would think, well, in a democracy, right, that's a, a free press is the core or one of the cores of a democracy, um, that transparency in government should be a good thing, right, that all of this news is spreading quickly. But 
if a democracy is about a conversation between politicians and public, any technology that complicates that conversation complicates a democracy. And so that's one of the many things that's going on right now. You don't expect violence, though, of the level that we saw in your book to break out. I mean, after all, we have all sorts of uh, police and metal detectors, and, and but it could. I mean, I, mean, I guess. I, I, you know, on the one hand, my immediate response to what you just said is, no, I don't expect that. You know, the book is about another place in time, in a sense. The 1850s and now are not equivalent, and how people engage in violence is not equivalent. And, and in the same way that Congress is representative then, it's representative now. Now, that said, if you had asked me 10 years ago, would I be seeing much of what we're seeing now, I would have said, no, there's no way. You know, I've written op-eds for the New York Times. I'm a historian who's basically centers in the early 19th century. This is not a thing I thought I would be doing. And, but I've now written op-eds saying, well, let's, let's see what we can learn from what these politicians were doing in the 1830s. What can that tell us about performing before the public or insulting people in Congress? So I have no idea. You know, I don't have a crystal ball as to what's happening. It, it, history matters in a lot of ways, and one of the ways in which it matters is it alerts you to what has happened before in moments like this and gives you a sense of things to watch out for. As we start wrapping up, I think our viewers notice your enthusiasm. I, as I researched you, noticed your enthusiasm. You just love what you do. You love history. You love bringing it to the public, to your students. Um, you started very, very young at age 14, reading the papers of Hamilton. Um, wh where is this passion coming? What, did, what is uh, causing this passion and excitement? And wow. why, do you, why do you love what you do so much? Wow, OK. That, that, uh, in all the interviewing I've done, I have not been asked that question. Um, I do care about it a lot. I mean, part of it, I think, is teacherness, right? So part of me, I think, just as someone who likes to teach and likes to see that moment when you're teaching something and you see it take a hold of someone, you see a student or a member of the public on their face, that you've communicated something to them, and that's a profound kind of a thing. So I like that. But I think when it comes to American history, we are a product of our past. We are our history. And many people, I think, think history is boring or history is a lot of facts and battles um, or what's happening now has never happened before and is coming out of the blue or the problems we're seeing now like suddenly appeared. Like, where did they come from? Why are they happening? And the fact of the matter is whatever is good or bad about us right now is born of the past. You have to understand that past to understand the present. And you have to understand, to me, the human component in that past. You have to understand that history is people making choices, sometimes making really stupid, bad, and occasionally immoral choices. But if you don't understand that about history, there's no way you can understand where you are and, and what you can get to, or what kind of um, hurdles or challenges or obstacles you're going to have to overcome to get past whatever it, you're engaged in with the moment. So I think that history is important at any time to understand what America is and who Americans are of all kinds, for better and worse, for good and bad. And I think in this particular moment in time, it's extremely important. Um, and I think sometimes people um make our history of the United States kind of a shiny bauble. I right. mean, you know, they, they, like there were no problems. Like everybody, right. as you said earlier, you know, just raised a finger and got things done. Right. Um, that's not the case. I mean, even John Adams, as I learned from you, um, former President John Quincy Adams, he, you know, all of the founding fathers wrote about this wasn't easy, this wasn't, we made mistakes. And, and people made bad choices. And America, throughout its existence, has had inequality, racism, ugliness, right? That's been there from the, the moment someone set foot in the North American shore. Those sorts of things have been in existence. To really grapple with our history, that has to be there, right? You can't make it a shiny bauble and say, eight great men went into a room and had a great idea, and look what happened. Well, yeah, but some of those eight great men thought that they owned people, right? I mean, and, and built that into what they were producing, and that's part of who we are. So it's not, you know, I think also people tend to 
assume that history is all good or all bad, right? I think some people even look at historians and say, well, you're just all out to show all the bad things and you're not willing to say any of the things that are good. And I think for most historians, that's not the case. As historians, we love the history of America, right? But we want to show all of its shadings and all of its facets. We want to show the problems and inequality and inequity and all of the difficulty and ugliness of the past so that what's right about the country will be better understood and we can work towards it. Your next project is going to be about Alexander Hamilton, the gentleman you've spent, oh gosh, over 40 years since you were a teenager being interested in. It's uh, called Hunting? Hunting for, for Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, so it'll be showing people how you can look in the record. How do you find the- people in the past? How do you rummage through their letters and sit yourself down where they sat and try to understand the people around them. How do you, how do you create, recreate a sense of a life in the past? So I'm using Hamilton because I know him so well at this point, but I'm really also bigger than Hamilton, interested in how do you find people in the past and what can you find and what can't you find and who is harder to find? I want people to think about the process, that history is a process, that writing history and thinking about history is ongoing, and the way you do it affects what you end up thinking. So for young people out there, or not so young people, but young people out there who are thinking, yeah, I want to be a history major, but mom says, or dad says, you you can't do anything with that. (laughs) Harumph. I offer a big harumph. As a history major, and for that matter, as a humanities major, But as a history major specifically, you learn amazing skills. You learn to write. You learn to evaluate evidence. You learn to reason and create arguments. You learn all of these basic things that no matter what your job is, those are going to be at the core of what you're doing. So to think, you know, well, you're a history major, you're going to go flip burgers, is a total misunderstanding of what you do when you study the humanities. You're, You're learning basic skills about thinking, and you're learning about how to think about other people. That's pretty crucial, whether you're in business, whether you're a lawyer, or whether you are going to go on and become a teacher. So um, all the parents lurking out there who think it's impractical to be a history major, um, I think you're, you're, you're not doing your right due by your kids because I think that way of, of understanding the world um, is crucial and, and needs to be perpetuated. Plus, it could be a lot of fun, too, it's right? It's really fun. <laughs> I guess that's kind of obvious. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me and our viewers about your work. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to reading your next book. Oh, well, thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Yale Professor of History, Joanne Freeman. If you'd like to hear more from her, I recommend her podcast, Backstory. And if you'd like to stream our dialogue interviews from the Sun Valley Writers Conference dating back to 2005, check out our website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Idaho Public Television Endowment.